No matter how you feel about nuclear energy, either in favor or against, there are some serious disadvantages to using it as a means to power our world. Here are the top five disadvantages of nuclear power. The first are accidents. There have been many accidents throughout the history of nuclear energy. The most famous are the partial core meltdown at Three Mile Island, the uncontrolled explosion at Chernobyl, and the flooding and loss of power at Fukushima. Limiting the list to those accidents with multiple fatalities or significant financial costs still produces around 30 incidents worldwide since the late 1950s. These are large-scale incidents that have caused real damage or cost people their lives, and despite the industry's best efforts, do seem to occur every few decades. Not exactly the friendly, safe image we might like to see. But why is nuclear susceptible to these types of large-scale accidents that grab everyone's attention? The reasons for this are special and unique to the nuclear industry. First, in the fundamental physics of how nuclear energy is created, and second, in the consequences of an accident, how they play out after an incident. Let's start with the first. Fundamental physics of nuclear energy are different from other energy sources. The majority of nuclear power plants in the world rely on a chain reaction using uranium as the fuel. This produces an enormous amount of heat in a very small volume, allowing for an efficient use of space and materials when operating a nuclear reactor. However, if something goes wrong and you need to stop the reactor from running, nuclear just doesn't quite work like that. When other sources like coal, natural gas, or solar, you can basically turn off the flow of fuel or oxygen, open the circuit breakers, and that's the end of it. The fires in the fossil plants will burn out rather quickly, and solar panels just kind of sit there. When operators stop a nuclear plant suddenly, it doesn't really stop. It slows down dramatically by about 97% in the first minute and 99% within the first hour, but it never totally goes to zero. While that may sound like enough, if the plant was previously producing gigawatts of power, even 1% of that is still going to be tens of megawatts of heat that need to be dealt with for hours, days, weeks, or even years. This is because after the chain reaction is stopped, many of the previously split atoms are still unstable and continue to decay for years. This is called decay heat, and it was responsible for the problems at both Three Mile Island and Fukushima. Basically, the operators at those plants were unable to deal properly with the decay heat after multiple system failures. Decay heat requires continuous cooling, and without it, water will boil away and the fuel can melt. Decay heat is such a concern that numerous safety systems and backup systems are designed into nuclear plants to try and minimize the chances that long-term cooling can be lost. The second reason nuclear energy has issues with large-scale accidents is how the consequences play out after the initiating accident has occurred. Along with the decay heat given off by the used uranium fuel, these unstable atoms also give off radiation. In short, radiation is particles or electromagnetic waves that carry energy. When these interact with living tissues, such as a person, it can damage the cells or DNA. If a person is exposed to enough radiation, it can kill them within a short while. Long term, damaged DNA may lead to cancers developing. When the reactor is operating normally, this radiation is contained within the structure of the plant itself. Smaller accidents are usually contained within the large concrete domes, so very little escapes. Severe accidents, however, can cause these radioactive particles to break through and breach all barriers and be released into the atmosphere where winds can carry them for miles. To mitigate this, all modern nuclear plants are required to have emergency planning zones and evacuation plans to minimize people's exposure or inhale these particles. These zones typically extend between two and five miles or three and 10 kilometers around a nuclear plant. Increased monitoring for food and water often extends much further 50 or 80 kilometers or more. This is to ensure that people don't consume radioactive crops or drink radioactive milk. So these two effects, decay heat and radiation, make nuclear energy much more difficult to deal with when things go wrong. The necessity to prevent and manage accidents goes into the design and operation of nuclear plants, which contributes directly into the second big disadvantage, cost. The constant threat of decay heat and radiation means that multiple redundant safety systems must be designed and manufactured, constructed, and maintained. Operators must be trained to deal with all of that equipment and how to respond properly if there are failures. Research, development, and testing of new materials and designs takes time and money with no guarantee of results. There is no way around it. Even after decades of experience, 
nuclear power is an enormously expensive way to generate electricity. All things considered, nuclear power is getting more expensive, while wind and solar have declined dramatically in the last decade. Nuclear plants are big and require a lot of money up front to build, and construction times can be very uncertain, taking as many as 10 years to build a single unit. In fact, the largest component of the cost of a nuclear plant over its entire lifetime is the initial investment in financing required for the construction, accounting for around 60% of the all-in lifetime cost of the plant, even after considering all of the fuel, operations, and maintenance, and these plants can run for 60 years or more. Delays in construction only add to the initial investment and interest charges on billions of dollars, and they rack up without generating any revenue from electricity. But is it fair to say that the increased cost of construction is solely because of safety requirements or regulations? A 2020 report by MIT reviewed several previous studies and found that in the US, constructing the same design of a plant became more expensive over time, outplacing inflation. Or to put it another way, the cheapest unit built was the first. The US Department of Energy looked at indirect and direct costs contributing to this and found the largest contributors for increased costs were soft costs, like engineering and management, not actual construction of material. Nuclear power has become so difficult and expensive that very few Western countries are willing to pursue any large-scale construction. The same, however, is not true in Asia, where places like Russia, South Korea, and China are able to successfully build reactors at much more competitive prices. In fact, around half of all new reactor startups in the past few years have occurred in China, while other countries are shutting them down. There are newer designs that are meant to be safer, more efficient, smaller, and with shorter construction times, but these have other unknowns to them, the main one being that generally nobody has built them on a commercial scale, and this is a big risk if you are a company or even a government looking to buy a nuclear plant. There are these new, shiny designs that are great on paper, but no one has built them yet. And if you're going to spend $10 billion on an infrastructure project, you need to be sure it is going to work or it'll end up being a giant waste of money. Nobody wants to be the politician or CEO that gambled and lost billions of dollars. So you do the sensible thing and you build what you know will work, even if there are shortcomings. The third disadvantage is nuclear waste. With the current design of nuclear plants, a significant amount of nuclear waste has built up over 70 years of operations. The most dangerous of which is the spent uranium fuel, which is leftover uranium that has had the majority of the usable energy extracted and will be dangerous for thousands of years. Around 400,000 tons of it has been produced, and the majority of it sits around at the power plants that made it. One positive aspect of nuclear waste is that it is solid and dense and easy to keep track of. It doesn't blow into the wind like coal plants for us to breathe, but it is still going to be with us for a very long time. The back end of the nuclear fuel cycle has been badly neglected by pretty much every country in the world. The vast majority of nuclear plants in the world operate on a once-through or open fuel cycle, where the uranium is used once in the reactor, and then it is discarded, generally because it is cheaper and easier to buy new uranium fuel. For the waste fuel though, because the decay, heat, and radiation make transportation difficult, it is typically stored at the same site that it was used, in large pools of water for at least five years, to allow the heat and radiation levels to decrease to where it can be handled more easily. Most sites then move the fuel out of the pools into steel and concrete casks, where it can be stored for around 100 years. But both of these are short-term solutions, at least when compared to the thousands of years that are needed to store nuclear waste. In the US, the Department of Energy is obligated by law to provide long-term storage facility, but so far has failed to do so. Up until 2013, waste disposal fees were collected from customers on electricity generated by nuclear plants and put into a fund managed by the Department of Energy. But a court ordered the agency to stop collecting them because, quote, DOE failed to conduct a sufficient analysis to permit it to conclude that the annual fee imposed on power plant operators is adequate. Basically, they didn't know how much it would cost, so therefore how can they say this is what the fee should be? Nonetheless, the Department of Energy has done some work on finding a suitable location for waste fuel. The most notable of these sites was the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository, but political impasse has meant that no significant action has been taken in the last 30 years. The only country to seriously address the waste problem is Finland, which has nearly completed construction on its Onkolo waste facility. Sweden, to their credit, is considering a similar approach, but these two countries combined only have about 10 reactors out of the over 400 globally. So, in general, 
The world has an increasing amount of deadly waste and no agreement on what to do with it. However, instead of throwing away used uranium, it is actually possible to reuse spent nuclear fuel, either in more advanced reactors or through a recycling method called reprocessing. Sounds great, right? Separate out the bad stuff and reuse the good to make recycled fuel. Except that the good stuff, in this case, is mostly plutonium. So you can see how that might be a problem. Which leads us directly to the fourth big disadvantage of nuclear energy, proliferation of nuclear weapons. It is impossible to talk about nuclear energy without talking about nuclear weapons. The very origins of the civil nuclear power industry are based on military applications. And the technology, systems, and materials can easily be redirected from one to another, at least in principle if a country chooses to do so. The main control we have on proliferation is what's through what's known as the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, which was enacted in 1970 with the support of the United Nations. It essentially says countries promise not to develop nuclear weapons, and those that already have them will work on disarmament. While 191 countries are signatories, more than any other arms agreement, the NPT identified five existing nuclear weapon states that already had nuclear weapons at the time, the US, Russia, UK, France, and China. Meanwhile, four countries have never accepted the NPT, India, Pakistan, Israel, and South Sudan. India and Pakistan are known to possess weapons, having conducted tests of their own. Israel maintains a deliberate ambiguity, but is widely believed to have several weapons, and South Sudan, which was only formed in 2011, is not believed to have any. North Korea was previously a signatory, but withdrew from the NPT in 2003 following underground tests. Significant economic and political sanctions have been placed on North Korea. The world has decided that one of the best ways to ensure compliance to the NPT is through a semi-sophisticated accounting of all nuclear material, like uranium and plutonium, known as safeguards. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, is tasked with this oversight. Non-nuclear weapon states agree to oversight from the IAEA through things like inspectors visiting sites, cameras, accounting reports, and will all be used to track material to make sure none of it is diverted for military purposes. This system works well for known facilities like power plants, and there has been a lot of success because of it. However, undeclared or secret facilities can be hidden and used to produce the necessary materials. Of course, this is a violation of the NPT anyway, so compliance is largely based on whether a country chooses to or not, or what public image they want to project internationally. All right. It should be clear by now that considering safety and operations, costs of construction, managing waste, risks of nuclear weapons proliferation, that any country seeking to build a nuclear program has a tough job ahead. The fifth disadvantage is the complexity of nuclear power. The IEA's guidance for nations looking to enter nuclear energy for the first time contains 19 areas of necessary infrastructure, such as setting up a regulator, training personnel, managing waste, and none of these are small or simple tasks and established countries are by no means any better. The US Nuclear Regulatory Commission's regulations are nearly 2,000 pages long, and that doesn't even include the hundreds of additional extras like regulatory guides to interpret the rules, or the thousands upon thousands of supplemental communications, standards, inspections, reviews, and enforcements. Add to this state and local regulations, financial requirements, environmental assessments, design, engineering, training, expertise, politics, and public opinion, and it is a very difficult business to be in and a very complicated way to make electricity. Of course, these regulations will vary from country to country, meaning economies of scale will be severely limited since even if someone manages to overcome all of these obstacles and successfully build a plant in one country, that does not necessarily translate into successfully building the same plant in another country. Suffice it to say, building and operating a nuclear plant is a difficult business with some serious problems. But it's not all bad. Click here to hear the other side, with five simple reasons why nuclear power is great for all of us. If you found this useful, please consider liking or subscribing. It really helps me know how to improve the content. And thanks for watching.